This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. And by Voltoro.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely, starting at just one milligram. Go to Voltoro.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. And by Coincap.io. With over 500 altcoin exchange rates updated in real time, Coincap is the authority for cryptocurrency market information. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with Mike Hearn. Mike has been on the podcast before, I think, just over a year ago, or just about a year ago. Episode 25. <laughs> Episode 25. And, uh, and we're back today to talk about a super important topic that I think anybody who's been following the Bitcoin news has uh, not managed to miss, which is the whole debate about increasing the block size from one to 20 megabyte. Or, and there's been a lot, of, a lot of controversy about it. And Mike has been one, sort of, one of the, I guess, thought leaders or the ones driving that discussion on, on the one side. So I'm super excited that he's able to join us today. Uh, thanks for coming on, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you were working on Lighthouse before, and we can come back to that at the end. And I think recently, like, like many, I mean, the Reddit has been literally uh, bla- plastered with posts about the debate about increasing the block size. And uh, I, I gave a talk about this topic at the conference in Prague uh, just recently. And I, on the way, I read through the entire Bitcoin dev mailing list, and it was as well, they're completely preoccupied about everything. So to give some context for our listeners, can you, can you talk about why this has come up so much and, and what, the, um, what the problem is we're trying to solve in this first place? Um, yeah. So uh, years and years ago, um, when Satoshi was still writing most of the code for Bitcoin, um, he uh, put in a temporary like clutch, if you like, a temporary hack, um, to limit the maximum size of a Bitcoin block to one megabyte. And as there's uh, one block on average every 10 minutes and transactions take up space in blocks, that implies there's a limit on how many transactions Bitcoin can handle. Um, when he did this, it was sort of, um, uh, he wanted to avoid people creating like really, really massive blocks by just stuffing them with rubbish. It was uh, basically an, an attempt to fix a pot- potential way that people could bloat up the blockchain and, and you know, just attack the system if they just wanted to troll and cause trouble. Um, and he, his intention was always that when the block size becomes less relevant to most users, that that limit be removed. Um, and uh, over time, actually, what has happened is every time people have talked about bumping this limit or, or even removing it completely, um, it's triggered these sorts of big debates. And um, the group of people who were, you know, sort of succeeded, um, Satoshi didn't agree. Um, and so nothing was done. And now what's happening is that our traffic levels, they're growing. Or, well, they, our traffic levels tend to grow in the um, northern hemisphere winter and then they sort of stagnate a bit in summer because everyone's outside but uh is, it, is that the reason yeah that, that seems to be the reason why these um it, it's not uncommon for uh, internet services to show seasonal growth patterns like this i've seen this many okay. times before and um so it looks like you know after next winter's growth season assuming you know bitcoin does grow as like it did last year then um we will bitcoin will be full we will actually run out of capacity and so uh, this debate has come up now because uh, Vladimir Van der Laan, who is a Bitcoin core maintainer, in theory, he's the decision maker. He posted the uh, release schedule for the next couple of releases of Bitcoin. And, um, you know, I emailed him and said, look, we, you know, it, given the schedule, we're going to run out of capacity unless we make a decision right now. And then that sort of kicked off this whole uh, thing again because, um, you know, he wasn't willing to make a decision there. So then, so you mentioned that there are different sides to this debate. Can you talk about what the different sides are? The different sides? Yes, of the of the yeah of the, of the current debate. debate. Yeah. Well, there's there's two. There's obviously there's the side that myself and Gavin have been championing championing um, uh, by writing articles and and doing testing and simulation and working through the objections, and that's raise the block size limit, of course. Uh, 
add capacity to the system effectively. Um, and then the, other, the opposing side is saying, no, we, we don't want capacity to ever increase. We want it to stay as it is. And then when Bitcoin fills up, uh, people will be forced to migrate to other systems. Um, that's, the, that's the debate. It sounds a bit ridiculous when I phrase it like that, but that's actually the, the core of this debate. And it is a bit ridiculous, I feel. I, I mean, of course, there is there is some some subtlety uh, we can talk about later, you know, especially when it comes about the the, the idea of security, and, and I think that's one of the sort of yeah. That, I, I, I still think they're slightly they're wrong about it in that I don't believe it actually will increase the security, but of course, uh, you know, one of the reasons why some people are against increasing the block size is because they think blocks need to be filled so people compete for space and miners make more money when the block board goes down. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different arguments that have been marshaled uh, in favor of doing nothing. And a big chunk of the work that myself and Gavin have been doing in the last few weeks is going over all of those arguments and, you know, responding to them and debunking them effectively. Um, So, yeah, most of these arguments are coming from a small group of people who they don't want to see um, Bitcoin you know, grow effectively. And then they sort of constantly coming up with new reasons they've thought of for why it's, why it would be bad. So it's sort of the cart before the horse, I feel a little bit, but we can go over the different arguments if you like. Well, let's, I think before we, we dive into the, these arguments, can you tell us a little bit about what you wrote in the blog post, especially in the, in the crash landing post, because I thought that was a really, uh, sort of a really vivid uh, illustration of what a worst case scenario could look like yeah. if Bitcoin runs out of space in a sort of, you know, relatively unprepared manner, which may well be the case if it happens soon. Yeah, sure. Um, right. So for background, um, I worked at Google for about seven and a half, nearly eight years. And several of those years, about three and a half of those years were spent doing capacity planning and traffic management for some of the world's largest websites. Right? I worked on Google Maps. I was on call for Google Maps and Earth. Um, so, um, you know, I, I have experience of capacity planning for systems. And I know what happens when they run out of capacity because I've actually seen it happen. Um, and so I wrote this article because there was a lot of people um, who maybe don't have experience like that who were saying, oh, it's no problem if we run out of capacity. You know, there will be this nice controlled fee market will establish itself. And, and everyone says, oh, I love markets. I'm a capitalist, libertarian, you know, market loving person. So what could possibly be bad about that? Um, but then when you, when you just drill down into the technical details, that's not actually the guaranteed outcome. And there are uh, many other outcomes which are much worse, right? You just have to work through how does Bitcoin work at a technical level to see this kind of thing. So I wrote this article to explain, you know, what could happen and, um, you know, the, the, the ways that software can malfunction, the way that, um, you know, Bitcoin can destabilize um, and, you know, the, the consequences of actually hitting the capacity limits. Can you talk about what that scenario would look like uh, if we were to hit those capacity limits as you described in your article? Yeah, so... Um, what tends to happen when systems run out of capacity is, uh, firstly, the service degrades simultaneously for everybody. Um, there's sort of an assumption uh, in some of these arguments for leaving the block size as is that you know we would get this nice priority ordering of where people would pay higher fees and so on. But what actually happens is you know people just keep paying the fees they are paying right up until the point where. Um, you know, blocks are really, really full and you're seeing hugely unpredictable confirmation times. So the first thing that happens, and we're already starting to see this a little bit, is people send a payment and they expect it to go through quickly and they discover it takes, you know, six, eight hours maybe to go through, um, which can easily interfere with business, right, if you're expecting it to be much faster than that. Uh, So that's the first uh, problem. And the the next problem that can happen is, um, you know, if you actually, if, if the rate of incoming transactions is becomes permanently higher than the rate at which they're being put into the blockchain, you can get this ever-growing backlog. And uh, the backlog of transactions in Bitcoin nodes is stored in memory, which is, you know, often a quite limited resource. So So just before you go into that, I just had a question regarding Mm -hmm. uh, what you just said. Do you think that the transaction volume would increase because people would just resend those transactions, assuming that they didn't go through or something like that? Why would, why do you assume that they would increase? Well, I mean, we're talking about organic growth here, right? As Bitcoin adds users, growth goes up naturally. Um, and then, you know, the coordination of the Bitcoin community globally is not, you know, 
it's not like everyone reads Reddit or everyone follows mailing lists or whatever, right? So as Bitcoin grows and people show it to their friends and other people hear about it in the news, you know, they download the software, they, they get some Bitcoins and so on. And then so traffic is going, going up over time. Um, and then, you know, as that sort of natural organic growth hits the ceiling, what you do start to see is cases where people say, oh, my transaction is not going through. So I'll rebroadcast it. I'll send another transaction. You also start to see... Um, you know, people uh, who were holding coins, but suddenly their faith in the system is shaken. And now they, they decide now is the time to get out. So they start moving coins um, into exchanges. And if you look at graphs of transaction activity, whenever there's a big change in Bitcoin prices up or down, suddenly a whole lot of coins that were stagnant for a long time start to move. And so, you know, if you, if you get a sudden um, step change in people's confidence in the system, then this causes another increase in traffic, which, you know, causes almost a kind of cascading failure and it gets even worse. Um, an analogy of this is, you know, um, when we had outages of major websites at Google, what we, we would actually see um, traffic go up and not down short for a temporary period of time because people would try and load, you know, YouTube, for example, it wouldn't load and then it'd hit reload, reload, reload. You know, they keep trying because they really want to watch their videos. And so suddenly um, normal traffic uh, changes completely and often you get pushed into an even more extreme overload situation as everyone simultaneously retries. Okay. So and, it can be quite of, hard to recover yeah. from that, actually. And then, of course, e even if we assume like those things don't happen in sort of an ideal thing, I mean, if you start having, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 2 megabyte sort of transactions every 10 minutes, and there's only one megabyte to go in a block, well, the, the amount of space taken up by these transactions that aren't in a block just keeps growing, 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 and that's never going to stop, right? Uh, and then, then, of course, that, that can be even exacerbated by situations like that where people panic and everybody tries to, or people resend transactions. Yeah. I mean, what would actually happen is, you know, people would, there, there'd be a spike in traffic as people, you know, suddenly lose confidence in the system and try and get out. Um, and then, you know, as the system slowly churns its way through these, the usage would drop again because people would say, this is stupid, I'm not going to use Bitcoin, right? My transactions aren't even reliable. You would get, if the blocks were completely full, um, you know, you would get cases where people are trying to pay for things, um, you know, pay for a coffee, for example, is the classical example, right? And then it, it, the, it would never confirm because they would blast it onto the network and then discover, you know, they weren't paying enough fees to, to ever be confirmed. And then the payments would just break, basically, right? They, they, they wouldn't be this nice fee market. The, ex the user experience would be just a paying people doesn't work. And then people would get upset. You know, they would feel betrayed because they put all this effort into evangelizing Bitcoin and telling their friends how great it is and how cheap and fast it is. And suddenly it's expensive and slow and it's not working. Okay. So they would, they would leave. So let's right? come back then to the, to the client. So the mempools start filling up. And can you explain then what, what happens after that? Um, well, no one knows because it's never really happened before. Um, but some nodes will eventually, if this keeps up long enough, um, will fall over and crash because they don't have any limits on how many transactions they will store in memory. Um, and it's not entirely clear how long it would take to do that because, um, you know, it is obvious that it would happen eventually if pressure is higher than, um, if demand is consistently higher than supply. But like I said, you know, users will also give up and go away. So um, while, you know, it's possible that we could have a sort of crash scenario where nodes actually start um, quitting, basically being killed by the operating system and have to manually be restarted. You would see a lot more like network instability, the network would shrink. But yeah, we, we don't know exactly how quickly that would happen. So regarding mempools, I, 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 I'm, I, so I learned about this you know, through your blog post. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, why do these transactions stay in RAM? Like, it seems like a weird software design choice to have these transactions stay in RAM and not get written to some file on the hard drive, uh, effectively like not well, causing well, they, so much bottleneck they, like on the system. They could be, but bear in mind that um, you know the, the Bitcoin's original design actually had a limit of like 32 megabyte blocks because that's the largest message that can be passed on the network. And holding 32 megabytes of, of transactions, um, even in the average case, you know, even if you double that and get 64 or 70, 80 megabytes of data, and even if you add a bit of you know overhead because a transaction in the mempool is not represented as efficiently as it is in the blockchain. Um, so even if you take into account all that overhead, you're talking about like 100 megabytes of data maybe, which is very cheap. Right? So why would Satoshi, you know, having code to write stuff out to disk and load it back again is additional complexity. And from Satoshi's perspective, it's just unnecessary complexity, right? So why would you, why would you implement that? 
Well, for this reason, exactly. <laughs> well, but he, ne he never planned for Bitcoin to run out of capacity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, this, this debate would appall him. Right? Yeah. Everything he always yeah, said yeah. was like, no, 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 Bitcoin can scale up. This is no problem. This is no problem. Right? This was like the first question he was ever asked about Bitcoin, and he explained this is no problem. So the fact that people would actually want Bitcoin to run out of capacity artificially isn't something that he would have ever planned for. I mean, I think also one of the ways to, to think about this whole debate is to think about it through the lens of the sort of outsider, right? The person who's been sort of uh, known a little bit about Bitcoin, but they're not, they're not like deeply involved in it like we are and following all the discussions and debates and know the different trade-offs. Because, I mean, if you talk about Bitcoin to a lay audience or a technical audience, you know, there's some ways you have to explain it. And I think there are certain metaphors people come back to, like, for example, you know, money is like it's information and, and sending it should be like fast and instant and like global and cheap. Yeah. Um, you know, that's like one of the things that we always tell about. And it's like, hey, the, the remittance use case, yeah, right. whether or not that's actually being used. But it's one of the it's a great way to illustrate how powerful it could be. You know, if someone can send like instantly money for free or, you know, for a, a, a few cents from Kenya to China and it's there, yeah. right? So when, when you now think of like, but let's say this does happen and you start having one of, first of all, it starts taking a long time to get confirmed. Second of all, it starts getting really expensive. And then also think of the user experience. Let's say you send out a transaction and then you have to wait and you don't know if it gets in a block or not. And if not, then you have to, you have to think about what fee, even that like is a crazy idea. And then we send it, it, it all, all, everything breaks down. Yeah. And, and I, I saw somewhere on Reddit, Luke Jr. make this comment. Um, he was like, yeah, I mean, it could be, right? But if, if it does break down, then I'm sure in a few weeks we could like uh, come around and then, then, then we could do increase yeah. the block size. I mean, this is like and, and then that's just, in my view, this is so delusional. You know, the idea that you have a few weeks. Because, I mean, I think Bitcoin is, is very fragile in, in that way, in that there's a, the trust is extremely important. And if the trust falls away yeah. and they the believe in the system and it has already... Even with things that, as Bitcoiners, we think, well, they actually have nothing to do with Bitcoin, like Mt. Gox, right? Yeah, right. In a way, it wasn't a, a problem of Bitcoin, but it hugely undermined uh, yeah. the image of Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. And now think of something like this happening, where it is actually a problem of Bitcoin. I think it would be a, a huge disaster. Yeah, I agree. It's time for a word from our sponsors, Ledger. Now, if you've been in the Bitcoin space, if you've been following this, it's no, it's no mystery to you and it's no news to you that security and securing your private keys is so important. And when I got in, first got involved in the Bitcoin space, I heard the same thing and I was like, I'm going to be a model Bitcoiner. I'm going to do it the right way. So what I did was I bought this like refurbished cheap old netbook for 100 euros on eBay and I set up Armory on there and I have an offline Armory and an online Armory and tried to run a full node on my laptop. And it was a truly horrifying experience. <laughs> and, and I still have not been able to get my Bitcoins off there. Well, I, I could, I guess, but <laughs> um, well, not with Ledger. That's right. Here it is. This is the Ledger. This is what I use to secure my Bitcoins. You plug this into a USB uh, port on your computer and you can use your Bitcoin wallet on any system, even if it's pest filled with malware, your Bitcoins will remain safe. And by the way, we have a special offer for our listeners. If you're interested in securing your Bitcoins right now and have it be easy rather than difficult, uh, you can go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EB09 and you'll get 10% off your first order. And by the way, if you're interested in learning more about Ledger, you can also listen to episode 216 of LTB with Thomas France, who's the co-founder. He explains um, how the product works. Uh, also, you know, goes into detail about the roadmap of the company. They're building some really interesting infrastructure for Bitcoin security. So uh, go to ledgerwallet.com and give it a try. And we'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Do you have any idea? Can you get, it's, it's hard to quantify, I suppose, but this, uh, this crash landing over how many days or weeks are we talking about here? Like, how do you I, I think that would play out? I, I, I don't know. I've never seen Bitcoin run out of capacity. Before. Of course, of course. But uh, it, it, are we talking days? Are we talking weeks? Are we talking months here? I would say there would be problems like the buildup 
um, well, there are going to be problems from now on, actually, because blocks are already sometimes being full and we're already seeing backlogs. But um, And for example, the Bitcoin wallet for Android by you know, Andreas Schilbeck, he's already bumped the fee paid um, by default. So we're going to see more and more of that over the next 12 months. Um, so that user experience degradation will, will keep happening um, steadily. And then if we actually, if we reach a point where every block is um, at the minor maximum, whatever they've got it set to, then I think we would see problems within days or we would see serious user complaints within days and, te- you know, serious, serious technical problems within weeks. But it's hard to say because the moment these things break, right, what happens is users abandon the system and then the pressure goes down again. So we might, what we might happen is this kind of bumpy equilibrium where users complain a lot, another batch leaves, you know, that leaving behind the, the only the more hardcore types who are willing to stick it out and, you know, it might be that the system never really stays over capacity for very long because demand falls away. Uh, I think it was Gavin Andreessen who who said, I believe it was on Let's Talk Bitcoin, that he saw it differently, that he didn't think that we were going to reach the capacity cliff in some sort of catastrophic crash landing, as you described in your blog post, but that people would, in fact, when we start reaching limits, people would, in fact, start leaving, uh, perhaps resort to other means of, uh, of sending transactions uh, through off-chain solutions or, I don't know, I thought perhaps or, altcoins. Or just stop, stop using or just stop using Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I, it's it, a lot of it depends on time and events we can't predict. Like if there was a kind of a panic, you know, if it was in, if, if you start seeing articles in like the New York Times saying, you know, Bitcoin on brink of technical collapse and then lots of people who bought some coins have them lying around but otherwise weren't really paying attention to the Bitcoin community, which I think makes up quite a lot of people from, you know, people I've talked to. And then they all suddenly try to, you know, sell their coins. Um, then, you know, that sort of spike driven like press driven spike could could cause sudden unexpected problems these things are very hard to predict though i don't want to put my my you know my hand down and say that's exactly how it will play out we should never ever even get close to finding out right of course that's like a complete disaster if we ever get close to this i i mean maybe maybe i'll come back to that let's first talk about some of the arguments uh, against okay against this so it's I don't know where to start, but so personally, I, I I have I have really difficulties finding them very convincing. And maybe maybe let me give this context first. So the way I think about this whole question of increasing the block size, right, is that you look at how does Bitcoin work today, and then we think of like what will happen when the transaction volume increases, and then you have two scenarios, right? Either you increase the block size or you don't. And then the question in my view is, which is the bigger change? And I think it's pretty clear to me that full blocks are a much more radical change to the network than having uh, a higher block size, right? Yeah. So I think in that context, if you want to leave the block size the same, that is the thing that has to be justified. That is the thing that you have to put research yeah. behind and stuff. Whereas the, the sort of argument I see a lot of people doing, but there's not enough research. We don't know enough what happens with the 20 megabyte stuff. And then and maybe that's true, but I think it's a more, much more clear to me that there's even much less research. It seems nobody has actually, for example, written up coherently how such a fee market could work. Right. It's, it's just like they say fee market and then think that yeah. solves it. But yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, if, if, if you can imagine it another way, if there had been no limit and now people arguing to put this limit in place and to force Bitcoin to run out of capacity and they were arguing for it instead of, you know, um, for the status quo, I don't think anyone would really, um, you know, go for that. I don't think they would get anywhere, right? People would say, no, it's working fine. Why would we, why would we do such a thing? Why would we make such a change? Um, so unfortunately, this is basically a case where you know, Bitcoin is sort of riding along on inertia and things that Satoshi would have not even hesitated to do are just not getting done. But so, okay, so let's talk about a few of these arguments. So one of them was uh, P- uh, Peter Todd said on the Let's Talk Bitcoin episode, uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well, is that you won't be able to run a full note behind Tor anymore. What do you think of that? Show me people who are doing that today. I mean, this is a trivial number of people running uh, things behind Tor. You know, the... The idea that uh, so he talks about this in terms of people running nodes in countries where Bitcoin is banned or being censored, 
Um, right. And so, of course, they can use Electrum or something like that. Yeah, I mean, they don't, they, they don't have to run a full node, but even if you accept they want to, um, you know, they can use VPNs, for example, which are far, far more popular than Tor has ever been for evading uh, government firewalls and things. Right. If you look at the popularity of a, just to pick one commercial VPN service out of thousands, um, uh, Hotspot, uh, not Hotspot, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, it's called Hotspot Shield. And um, it's done by a company called Anchor Free, and they are orders of magnitude larger than Tor, right? Um, whenever there's a major censorship event in, say, Turkey, their traffic goes up, you know, by around, you know, thousands and thousands of times more than what Tor's does. So this fixation on Tor, you know, it doesn't really make any technical sense when you look at the market. Um, and this idea that uh, if, if you're in a country where Bitcoin is banned, you know, you're going to be mining and things, it, it doesn't seem like a very realistic idea to me anyway yeah i know i agree with you uh, i mean i'm pretty sure like doing this right now would be a pretty miserable experience trying to run a full note behind tor well uh, yeah right it's uh, it's not i mean it's adding a lot of latency for no real reason you don't need tor to get through firewalls and when you're yeah. up against arguments like this i mean it's, it's pretty clear that you're trying to make an engineering argument uh uh, in yeah. front of a, a, an ideological argument. So, I mean, it's sort of like trying to argue with um, fundamentalist Christians in some, it does in feel, some way. Yeah, it feels like that sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you know, it is a bit of a caricature, but it, it, that's yeah. both the extent so, of the debate, right? It's been a major frustration of me and Gavin for a long time now. We've been saying, look, you know, make a proposal, put numbers in it, right? When you object, put numbers in your objection, right? We're, we're supposed to be engineers here. So do engineering. And what you get back, it, the, the, the people who are against these sorts of things, they have never, ever done this, right? They never sit down and they, do, they never do back of the envelope calculations in the way that engineers do. And it's incredibly frustrating because they, they often pick some extremely academic or theoretical point and just assert it as truth. And if you don't agree, you must be an idiot. You know? So these sorts of engineering-based arguments, you know, Tor isn't that popular. There are other systems that are. They work just fine for mining if you want to do that. Then... You know they don't um, they, they don't convince these other people because they weren't really open to being convinced in the first place. So there is one um, one point I think that that does probably have some validity, and I'm curious on your view on that. So what, one question, right, is the, um, what kind of an advantage do large mining pools have over small mining pools and over solar miners? I mean, of course, one is the variance, but then there are other things. Uh, in particular, there's a risk of getting orphaned. Mm -hmm. And uh, orphaned means basically if you mine a block, you, f you find a block, so you, you think like you may get the block reward, but then someone else finds one around the same time and in the end you lose out. And, and you are at a disadvantage with that if you're a small mining pool. And some, some listeners may remember the episode we did about selfish mining with uh, Amin Gunsir and Isa, Itai Eyal who wrote on this. So um, it, it does seem to be true, probably, right, that if you have bigger blocks and they propagate more slowly, then actually it becomes a little bit more of a disadvantage, right, if you are a, a smaller mining pool as opposed to a bigger one. Do you, is that a concern you have? Well, no. I, so Gavin has written about this quite extensively. You know, if everyone is making bigger blocks, then the orphan cost doesn't change because, you know, your competitors get orphaned as much as you do. So in the end, it, it washes out. Um, if you're making... But if you're, if you're a bigger mining pool, you get less orphaned, right? No. It has nothing yeah. to do with how big your mining pool is. It's well, to do with your connectivity, if... right? And your connectivity to other miners. But in terms of the number of people hashing on your pool, it makes no difference. Well, but if you find a mining block, uh, if you find a block, right, yeah. and you immediately start mining on your own block, right, because that doesn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. And so if, so that's an advantage, right, if you're a bigger miner. You I mean, mean if you get blocks more frequently. I mean, the, the, point of right. the, the point of the difficulty adjustment is you shouldn't be, you know, finding a block immediately after another block that you've just found, like with any frequency, right? That, that will happen very, very occasionally, but it's not supposed to happen uh, frequently. If it is, then that, that the difficulty adjustment will kick in and... I, mean, I, guess, I guess the way well, you can think about it is this way, right? So if, if you find a block as a mining pool, mm -hmm. uh, then there's probably some period... Uh, if someone else finds a block, there's probably some period you're not mining on that longest chain, so your work's probably wasted. But if you're the biggest pool and you find it 
And then you can immediately mine on that. Like that time you lose because you don't have the longest chain is, is less compared to other pools. I mean, I, I think this is probably true, but it's also, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a fairly small effect and there are all kinds of other things having that effect as well. Yeah, I mean, with respect to the orphaning costs and so on, I mean, it's fairly low today, um, but we don't have an optimized protocol really at all, right? So we've known for a long time that we can, um, every transaction is broadcast twice in the Bitcoin network, which doesn't make much sense. There are various ways to fix that and so on. And Gavin has researched some of these mechanisms. But, um, you know, bear in mind that what we're raising, what we want to raise here is a hard limit. Whenever you have a, a system, uh, a large software system, there are a variety of scaling bottlenecks, right? You, you encounter one, you remove it, then you move on to the next one, you remove it, you move on to the next one, you remove it. There's always going to be a next bottleneck to fix. So by, you know, it looks like we're going to hit this self-imposed one uh, fairly soon. So right now the effort is on removing that one. And then maybe we get up to four megabyte blocks or whatever with enough time and organic growth and growth of the, the Bitcoin user base. And then we discover that miners don't want to go beyond four megabytes because of orphan costs or whatever. And they're, they're deliberately capping the size of the blocks they make to less than the theoretical limit. That's called a, a soft block size cap, right? A soft block size limit. Then we say, okay, then that's the next bottleneck. And then we work on fixing that. So I'm not too worried about this because, you know, we can see some of these bottlenecks coming up. We don't know exactly where they'll hit, but we anticipate at some point they'll exist. And there are solutions already being researched and worked on. So we, we wanted to ask that, but maybe we can, we can clarify this right now. So with a soft, a soft cap or a soft block, is that just a minor? Yeah. In, I mean, right now, a miner can mine empty blocks if they want to, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, is that this? So does that just mean that if you have a twenty megabyte limit, a miner can of course mine blocks of whatever size up to twenty megabytes? Yeah. And is that achieved through consensus of miners, or no, it's, does it's everybody a, do what they want? It's just a configuration setting uh, in Bitcoin. Okay. Because right now that's with seven hundred fifty kilobytes. No, is that? Well, that's the default. Um, I argued, or I, I vaguely recall arguing when this was set to 750, that it should just be set to one megabyte. There shouldn't be, effectively, the soft and the hard limit should be the same. And I wish we'd done that because now we have some miners who aren't, they don't know about this setting or they don't care or, you know, whatever, and they just leave it at the default. And so we're actually, we're hitting capacity limits even earlier than we should be, right? Because just because miners aren't really paying attention and they're not raising this soft limit. So what, when we move the hard limit to 20 megabytes or whatever, whatever the final patch is, um, one of the issues that I'm going to be looking at is what do we do with a soft limit? And I think the correct solution will be to um, default it to the same as a hard limit. So by default, miners never throttle their block size deliberately. Yeah, yeah. And they can, okay. Um, so regarding, I had a question regarding network propagation, what we were just talking about earlier, where uh, large miners are uh, in a, a, at an advantage over small miners. I, I think that the assumption is that large miners have a much faster internet connection and can upload blocks a lot faster than a small miner. No, and that's where that's, they would be. No, am I wrong? In the, I think in you're wrong. I think large miners, large miners have an advantage mining, but that's, that's just the way right now. I mean, yeah, I mean blocks may, should, bear in mind that Satoshi set 10 minutes interval um, on the idea that blocks would take one minute to propagate and there would be 10% wastage of work through orphaning. And he was yeah, like, yeah, that yeah. sounds fine to me. If there's 10%, then that's cool. Right. So obviously miners were incentivized to make as much profit as they, they can, but um, they're also incentivized to move people's transactions because otherwise Bitcoin doesn't have value. So there's, there's some kind of interplay there where some kind of um, you know, orphan rate is acceptable and, and miners have, the, they ha they have all the tools they need to figure that out. And at the software and network level, we have the tools to reduce it as well. Um, absolutely. So one of the... Well, let's address one small point. Uh, that, I think that's also a strange argument I've seen. So Greg Maxwell brought up in one Reddit post that, you know, as, as many people know, the number of, of nodes on the network has decreased dramatically. It was, yeah. I think, about 100,000 at one point, and now it's about 5,000. Um, and, you know, that I personally, I'm not sure if this is related to the block size very much, to some extent, perhaps. Uh, but do you think that... First of all, do you think it matters how many nodes there are? And do you think there is some sort of uh, lower limit or amount we should strive for? And, and do you think if the block size was increased to 20 megabytes, 
this could maybe worsen this and decrease the number of nodes even further? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I need to dig in a bit. I think the claims that we had 100,000 you know, full nodes at any point are a bit dodgy, to be honest. Um, these days, we count number of nodes because we have pretty good network crawlers that have been tuned. And they crawl the network and they measure uptime and they ignore nodes that come and go quickly and things like that. Whereas, you know, several years ago, we didn't have that. Um, and the way we had accounting nodes was not that great, to be honest. You know, um, We weren't like measuring whether these nodes are stable and fully reachable and stuff. Um, so I doubt we've ever really had 100,000 full nodes in the sense we would call, we would use the term full node today. But sure, if it was, it was higher in the past, you know, even um, once good crawlers were established, you know, we were seeing like nine, ten thousand 10,000 nodes and it's shrunk now. Um, the number of nodes we need in terms of need for the technical operation of the network to function is dependent on how many um, SPV wallets we have that are synchronizing with these nodes. And we don't have any idea how many nodes we need for that. Um, it's one of those sad things about Bitcoin engineering that, you know, all this work is being put into this arguing and actually very little work is put into basic measurements and metrics. So we don't really know how many nodes we need to serve the current user base. But apparently 5,000 is a lot. 5,000 is a lot of machines, um, a lot of servers. Um, just to put it in perspective, um, when you think about how much work can 5,000 computers do, uh, all of WhatsApp was at one point running on 1,000 machines. Now, 1,000 very good machines with very tightly optimized software, but still a much smaller group of machines than Bitcoin today. And they, was, they were routing a million messages a second. So way beyond um, you know, our one or two you know, per second, which is what Bitcoin is doing. So we have a lot of computers doing not very much um, in terms of serving the network. So if, if we assume that Bitcoin continues to grow, but that uh, let's let's make the assumption that that there are less nodes as a result of the, uh, the block size increase. What would that do to the network stability? What what would be the impact on yeah, uh, the, potential censorship or centralization, like issues uh, with regards to centralization of uh, of Bitcoin? Well, I wouldn't worry much about the centralization. Bear in mind, anyone who wants to can run a full node. And in the past, a lot of people were forced to, even though they didn't really want to. Um, so there's a natural decline as you know better options for those people come along. Um, you know, like a lot of the original idea, right, is that all merchants will run a full node. And in the beginning, they did. But these days, we have companies like BitPay and Coinbase, and they handle lots of things, including running nodes for you. So um, that's more centralized. And if those companies, but, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a weak form of centralization, because you can imagine if BitPay or Coinbase started charging really high fees, or they got really bad policies or whatever, then people would say, okay, you know, I'll just run my own nodes, and I'll, I'll put my own storefront in front of it. It's not that hard. Um, so to some extent, you know, uh, people not running their own nodes is a, it's a matter of convenience, right? If they wanted to, they certainly could. And the actual uh, number of nodes we need is, yeah, like I said, dictated by the serving capacity for these other kinds of wallets. Um, if need be, you know, there could be techniques to incentivize the running of nodes, paying for their services, things like that. But I don't see any signs we need that at the moment. So it's time for a word from our sponsor, VaultRoyal.com, the gold Bitcoin exchange. Now, you may be asking yourself, why do I need gold? I have everything I need. I have my TV, my couch, and I have my bag of Bitcoins. But uh, gold, after all, it has been around for a little bit longer than Bitcoin. And uh, Josh, the CEO of VaultRoyal, wrote an interesting article on the VaultRoyal blog. We'll, we'll link to it. And he was writing that a lot of the central banks, a lot of the governments around the world are hoarding gold. And the reason, of course, is that when a financial crisis comes, like that's the one thing you can sort of fall back on and sell there. So maybe that's something to consider as well when you are thinking about your own central banking policy. My central banking policy is to buy gold, and I use Voltoro to do that. <laughs> and um, so you can go to Voltoro.com and start trading today, and it takes literally in minutes uh, to start buying your first uh, milligrams of gold because you can start trading at just one milligram and the trading fees are as low as 0.2%. And by the way, there's no KYC required for up to $5,000 worth of deposits per day. So you could really use this as a way to hedge uh, some of the volatility risk that, uh, that you have when you're holding Bitcoin. So there you go. So go to Valtoro.com, give it a try. And we would like to thank Valtoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Let's address one of the one of the maybe a bit bigger bigger picture and more important issues in this debate, and I think that's that's a question. You know, is Bitcoin 
like the sort of core Bitcoin where transactions are actually in the blocks, is that scalable at all? Can that at one point, or is it even desirable to try to make that scale to a point where it can handle, I don't know, uh, maybe thousands or thousands of transactions per second? Or is really the future that transactions move off chain, hopefully in some sort of trustless ways like, uh, like Lightning Network? Uh, and and that sort of evolution is natural. And, and I mean, I guess you can agree with that and then you can still not agree with the uh, related point that a lot of, of the developers make is that this evolution is natural and we need to sort of force it to move that way by you know not giving people any space. They have no choice. Mm. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, I mean, first of all, will transactions have to move off chain? And second, is it desirable to try to... Yeah, you know, um, you know, I think in this case, what we should be following is um, Satoshi's original vision for the system for a couple of reasons. One is it's actually a pretty well thought out vision. Um, you know, people questioned it on questioned him on it the moment he announced Bitcoin, even before code was available, and he'd already thought through these issues. Right, he had thought about scalability a lot. Um, he made you know he made claims like, oh, you know, even if we scale to Visa size, then you know it's just the equivalent of moving a few HD movies per day. Um, you know, he'd done the he'd done the calculations. That said, even even though he'd done that, um, you know, he picked a reference point, which is Visa, which is not a bad reference point to pick if you're trying to design a financial system. But then he went further and he said, you know, maybe people want to do really high frequency trading with each other. Maybe you, you want to see like, you know, a hundred trades per second just between a few people. And maybe that doesn't need to be on the blockchain. So he designed um, these high frequency trading protocols on top of Bitcoin. And the the modern concept of lightning networks and so on is sort of vaguely based in some of the things that he was doing there. Um, even though the original mechanism he designed got disabled um, a few years ago. So he thought about these things and he, he drew some lines in the sand. He was like, yeah, we could totally move all of the payments being done with credit cards onto Bitcoin. That would work. And then, but if you talk about like high frequency stock trading, that wouldn't work. And he designed other mechanisms for that. So there's clearly some kind of line somewhere. And I think where he drew the line is pretty reasonable. Um, you know, drawing the line at one megabyte blocks and then saying everything else should, you know, be done on this different system, actually, even if at the end of the day it settles on the blockchain, that's not reasonable. I don't see any, you know, if you if you try and convince me that that's a good idea with the maths, I won't agree because there's just no credible, if you just look at what computers can do and how fast they are, it doesn't make sense to draw the line there. So I think we'll see, um, I think it is perfectly reasonable for Bitcoin to process thousands of transactions per second, right? I mean, there are websites that handle thousands of hits per second. Lots and lots and lots of them do that. And we don't say, oh, my God, you know, the web is decentralized, even though you wouldn't run a website that handles that sort of traffic from home. Um, you know, people just don't do that. But, you know, the web is still a decentralized system, right? So um, I, would, I would worry about it less than other people do. But do, do you still think that it's likely that we'll get to the point where the same Bitcoin network is handling really large high value transactions and really small transactions like coffee or even micropayments like well why not i mean people pay for you know expensive holidays and very you know even quite expensive things with credit cards and then also for their cups of coffee i see no reason why the size like the monetary size of the transaction should matter but if, but if we have uh systems like the lightning network and you know i do realize that it's it's only a white paper for now but if those types of systems get implemented and we have really fast payments uh, which don't necessarily require like a 10 minute confirmation time and uh, are significantly cheaper than perhaps what Bitcoin would offer if you have all these higher value transactions and fees start going up. Um, don't you think people would start using those rather than uh, use yeah, Bitcoin? Yeah, could be. I mean, if, if you know, some Lightning Network ish or Strom or whatever system is, you know, layers on top of Bitcoin. I mean, I think it, it, it's very likely we will see systems layer on top of Bitcoin. Um, I'm a little skeptical it'll be the Lightning Network specifically, but it might be. And that's fine, right? If that's the way the system evolves naturally because that's what people want, then that's okay with me. Um, being People being forced into it whether they want it or not is definitely not okay with me. I, don't, I think if you look at ways in which people will get faster payments on top of Bitcoin, I think uh, the use of trusted computing is a lot uh, more reasonable, a lot easier to deploy. And frankly, it's probably closer. I know there are companies working on this stuff already. So the technical, from a technical perspective, I'd say the use of um, 
uh, remote attestation and trusted computing is a lot more likely to give us, you know, super high confidence uh, instant payments with Bitcoin than Lightning Network. But th these are, you know, these are technical issues on which reasonable people can disagree. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there's um, the Lightning Network. It, it kind of makes sense to me. I think it's a reasonable idea and it's all. But I think what's, what's been really uh, deceptive and maybe intellectually slightly dishonest is sort of confusing those two, right? Because first of all, it's clear that it's not nowhere ready. I mean, we, we did an episode with them and they themselves said that. And the other thing they also said, well, the two other things, are, first of all, even if it worked, they still would need much bigger blocks. And you know, even if actually people only were using the Lightning Network for all, if you want to have Bitcoin at some scale, you know, people have to open and close channels and they actually have, you know, uh, multi-sig transactions which are larger. So uh, there's no question you still would need to increase the block size significantly. And then the other thing they said, well, their security model actually becomes worse if the blocks are full because that's a problem for them too. So it's uh, clearly, whatever one thinks of it, it is clearly not a solution to this. Um, and of course, it's also very complex to do, right? There are a lot of aspects, uh, like this whole server stuff one needs to build, the wallets need to change, merchants need to change that. So the idea that this is somehow achievable in a really short time frame is quite obviously not true. Yeah, and I agree it's obvious. And I wrote an article laying out why it should be obvious. And um, it sort of disappointed me that, you know, the Blockstream guys um, ignored that completely. And now they actually hired a guy called Rusty Russell and said, oh, you work on Lightning Network. And he published a blog post, it was either today or yesterday, uh, where he outlined exactly the same conclusions. He said, this is not going to deliver a solution in the time frame we need. We need bigger blocks. So everybody who has looked at this and the people who proposed it originally in their white paper to myself, to Rusty at Blockstream have all said, this is not, this is not going to happen. We need bigger blocks. And unfortunately, this doesn't seem to have any impact on um, the people who are stalling this debate. Today's magic word is spoon, S-P-O-O-N. Go to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So let's uh, talk about another topic that has come up in these discussions, especially on the mailing list. Uh, so Gavin Andreessen proposed that uh, if there was no consensus on increasing the block size, that he would start pushing uh, developers, uh, companies, startups within the ecosystem to move to Bitcoin XT, which is a fork of Bitcoin that you uh, developed. Can you first talk about what exactly is Bitcoin XT for those who perhaps don't, aren't familiar with it, as I was, uh, and, uh, and also why this would be uh, a, 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 a possible solution to, this, uh, to resolving this debate? Yeah, it's actually not my preferred solution. My preferred solution is that Gavin revokes commit access from everyone else in the project and then, you know, makes a change himself and says this is, you know, Bitcoin Core has made a decision and this is how it's going to be. Um, he's reluctant <laughs> to do that. That sounds pretty dangerous, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's going to that's gonna get a lot of... <laughs> well, I mean, this, this, I don't know of any other open source projects that have this notion of development by, you know, quote, consensus, which is, we can talk about that in a, in a minute, but it's not really yeah. development by consensus. Every project... Uh, that I know of, uh, certainly every successful open source project has a kind of benevolent dictator, is what we call them. Right? They, someone who makes a decision, right? a technical leader. Um, and Bitcoin Core doesn't, and that's a big part of the reason we have this issue. So Bitcoin XT is a, it's the same program as Bitcoin Core with very small number of modifications um, to it. And this Bitcoin XT arose last year because I needed to add a feature to the Bitcoin protocol for Lighthouse to make its user interface perform well, basically. Um, so I, pre I, I prepared this change and I submitted it for inclusion into Bitcoin Core and there was this like massive dispute, massive technical debate, not quite as big as the block size, but you know it went on forever. Um, same sort of thing, right? A lot of the arguments uh, made against this very simple 50 line change didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And eventually, actually, uh, Vladimir, he did integrate it into Bitcoin Core and I thought, oh, well, you know, that took forever, but at least it's done. And then a few days later, um, you know, uh, it got reverted by some other guy who has commit access, who I won't name. And then when I submitted it again, uh, he was like, oh, this is, this is quote a shitstorm. I'm not going to touch it. So 
I, you know, threw up my hands at this point and I said, look, you know, you guys cannot make decisions and stick to them. I'm going to, I'm just, I need to launch Lighthouse, right? I can't wait around for you guys all day. So I'm going to make my own version of it. And, and that's the genesis of Bitcoin XT. There were a couple of other changes that have hit the same problem. It's not just, it's not like me. <laughs> it's like other people who made proposed changes also hit this exact same wall. And then I went and I fetched, um, uh, fetched at least one of those changes and put it in Bitcoin XT too. So I made it a home for changes where I thought the arguments made sense and they hit this kind of stall, you know, we must have consensus over everything, you know, block, blocking of changes. Now, just to be clear, the, the changes that you that you made in, in this XT fork don't, uh, I mean, there's, it's, it's still compatible with the Bitcoin core. Yeah, it doesn't change the right. blockchain. Right. So, yeah, and uh, it does not include 20 megabyte no, blocks. No, currently it yet. does not, no. Yeah. And so uh, what is the idea then that in some time after some uh, assume like, you know, all these startups start using Bitcoin XT, then we include the 20 megabyte block no, uh, in, um, in XT? What's going to happen is uh, either today or tomorrow, I will, I will release another version of Bitcoin XT, which also doesn't include any block size changes, but it, it just tidies a few things up. Um, and then probably within a week or two, Gavin will have a change that's ready to submit to me for Bitcoin XT. And then we'll integrate that and uh, release it to as a new version of Bitcoin XT that anyone can upgrade to. And that will include a uh, block size increase? Yeah, well, what it will include is code which effectively votes. So as miners start running this code, they will effectively embed a vote for bigger blocks into the blockchain. And then once, once the software sees that the, uh, there's a majority of people voting for this change, then it will start to create bigger blocks, right? And if at this point you're, on the, you're still running Bitcoin Core, then you'll get split onto a separate blockchain. So, so the Bitcoin XT software will communicate, you know, we want bigger blocks and then it will, will see how many messages does it get back. And at some point, if it's a majority, it will switch. Yeah. Okay. okay how does that work exactly? So how does this voting mechanism It's been used before. Function? So it's the same mechanism that we've used uh, to roll out changes before. Every block has a version number in it. And uh, miners can, for example, set that block version to be block version three, for example. And then... Uh, Bitcoin XT would look at the past, you know, it would, add, it, would, it would add up the number of version three blocks in a past time window and then just calculate a percentage. And by there, through that rolling window of time in the blockchain, it can see what the support for the change is. Okay. Um, and, and so, what would happen with uh, those miners who remain on Bitcoin Core? So, that means if they mine blocks, they would just get ignored? Yeah, they would go onto a side chain and, and any coins they um, uh, were to mine wouldn't be recognized by exchanges or merchants that were running Bitcoin XT. Okay. Um, so does that mean, is this, is this going ahead? Is the, the plan is to, to do it this way? And then I guess, does that mean uh, you guys, you and Gavin, maybe some other people who volunteer will... I will talk to miners, we'll talk to people to switch over to XT? Um, well, I, you know, I emailed Vladimir earlier today to you know, have one last attempt at convincing him uh, that this is the correct path forward to, to grow the block size. And then, yeah, if that doesn't uh, work, then we'll do, a, um, we'll do Bitcoin XT. We've already been talking to a lot of places. We've talked to businesses, exchange owners. We've talked to some big mining pools. We've talked to a whole lot of different stakeholders in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And the, the support is extremely strong for Bitcoin XT, right? Some of these people are just saying, just get on with it already. So we don't know exactly how much support, but we know there's a lot. And um, what we would do is, yeah, we would pick some threshold at which point the fork would happen and then go and talk to miners and say, look, you need to, you need to upgrade. This is what the community wants. So I've got a couple of questions about this. Um, so essentially, then this is a hard fork. So you're asking people to change their software to another version of uh, of Bitcoin Core, which is a fork. Um, if you're going to do that, like why not just ask them to to update their software to another fork of Bitcoin Core? Like, well, that's what it is, effectively. Okay. 
Bitcoin XT is just a name for a slightly modified version of Bitcoin Core. But why Bitcoin XT? Why not just make a fork of Bitcoin Core and call it Bitcoin Core 20? It's confusing, right? Well, I mean, Bitcoin, yeah, it could have been called Bitcoin Core 20, but when I, you know, I've already like done all the rebranding to XT and right. okay. XT is, it has a few other minor changes. It's not just block size limits, right? Okay. And then, so for, for Bitcoin companies that are using Bitcoin Core to power whatever yeah. they're building, right? So let's say it's like, I don't know, chain.com or something. Like they're using mm-hmm. Bitcoin Core. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're using Bitcoin Core, but perhaps there are companies that are not using uh-huh. Bitcoin Core uh, and wallets, for instance. I mean, I assume yeah. that B- Bitcoin J would include all these uh, changes as well because you you um, commit to it. But what about the other Bitcoin clients out there? It would require for them to rewrite their software. Potentially, that could be... No, not really. So most, wa- most wallets don't care about the block size at all. Um, for example, Bitcoin J, you said Bitcoin J would need to be updated. The, by far the most common way Bitcoin J is used is in SPV mode, in which it doesn't download the full blockchain. Oh, in this right, mode, okay. it doesn't actually know how big blocks are. It doesn't yeah. care. So all of those wallets, all of your bread wallet on iOS, all of your Bitcoin wallets and, and Hive and so on, um, all web wallets, for example, they don't need to change, right? It's only people who are running um, Bitcoin Core that would need to, or you know, a re-implementation like there's one that written in Go called BTCD. But the, the actual code change is very small, right? We're talking about it's not quite just adjusting one number, but it's. Do you, uh, do you have an idea small. of how many companies are using Bitcoin Core in the back end, or, or or perhaps have written their own implementation of Bitcoin? They're, all, they're basically all right, uh, running Bitcoin Core at some okay. level. Usually, if they've written their own implementation, it'll be connected to you know their own nodes which they'll run Bitcoin Core, um, which connects to the peer-to-peer network, and then they'll connect their own version of Bitcoin to their own Bitcoin Core. So a few companies like Coinbase might need to you know, spend an afternoon writing a bit of code. It's, it's a very small change. And how trivial is this change? I mean, because you know, fundamentally, you just take one climb out, put, put in the other. But uh, I, you know, for companies that have rigorous software testing procedures and such like how trivial would this be for them to actually change that how likely is this to happen is basically what i'm trying to get to it's very trivial for these companies so the the best way um to these companies should be organizing things i don't know if they all are but i know a lot are is um you know if they have software that's create calculating a database from the blockchain or whatever it is they want to do they should just be connecting to their own private nodes and then they can just take out the block size check, bear in mind. If their software is connecting to their own copies of Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin XT, the check is already being made by those programs anyway. So doing it again doesn't actually add very much, right? Unless they have some kind of philosophical desire to do it all themselves in their favorite programming language or whatever. In which case, okay, you know, they've taken on the burden of keeping up with changes in the Bitcoin protocol. And they knew that when they started. Okay. So, so then in that case, if... Well, I mean, if we extrapolate, so if, if most companies that you've talked to are on board with this, with switching to Bitcoin XT, then what, what you're saying is essentially that this is going to happen. This block size increase is going to happen no matter what. I think so. Yeah. There's, the only question is um, how long does it take for people to you know, opt in? Um, do we really have the majority that we think we do? I mean, you know, from polling, you know, going and talking to you know, um, important players in the ecosystem, we think we do. But there's nothing quite like measuring it for real. Mm -hmm. And then the worst case scenario is the majority of um, the economic majority uh, that we call it is in favor, uh, but the hash power, the mining majority is not. That would be a very messy situation for Bitcoin. So uh, can you explain that? How, How would that happen? So you mean that, like, let's say Coinbase and the big companies and they're all in favor, but the mining uh... yeah so let's say that um you know so there's there have been some concerns raised by mining pools in china for example where there's a lot of mining going on that their connectivity is extremely poor to the rest of the internet for a bunch of reasons um so if the needs of the wider global bitcoin community start diverging from what you know miners in china want then who wins well, the answer is the economic majority wins, right? The uh, the wider community wins, but it would require a bit of you know, a bit of a technical mess to to sort everything out in that case. Because you somehow have to get uh, 
clients to ignore potentially the longest chain to yeah. only accept Yeah, Bitcoin. so people, again, merchants and, and exchanges that would be running Bitcoin XT, if we imagine this sort of worst case scenario happening, they would ignore the longest chain. It doesn't matter that it's the longest. If it's, um, uh, uh, you know, well, let, no, let me rephrase that. They would, they, they they would, would be take forced. the longest chain with that specific version of the software, right? Yeah, so let me rephrase that, right? Like if miners were building a longer chain than the 20 meg chain, um, then, you know, the client would keep switching back to it and would keep ending up with this bigger and bigger backlog. Um, and at that point, what we would have to do is like checkpoint uh, blocks into both the full nodes and the SPV wallets. So that's a much larger and more complicated upgrade um, to force it onto the larger chain, right? And in the worst case scenario, if the miners and the rest of the Bitcoin community end up in some kind of like full-fledged war, that would basically wreck Bitcoin. So we would hope that miners wouldn't do that. Of yeah. course, it's not in their best interests to mess up Bitcoin for everyone. So, but let's say even this XT, switcher XT and larger block size happens. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one thing that's, that's really clear, I think if one follows it, they have mailing list. There is so much uh, disagreement and animosity and, and almost hatred between people. It's uh, uh, quite frankly, I find it a bit worrying. Uh, and uh, it there's, does not seem to be a lot of sort of cold headed rational analysis of what's actually the best way to go. And uh, I mean, it seems if, if this happens and now we have uh, most of the people with commit access to Bitcoin Core are, are against this and they will be sort of left behind. I mean, it seems like that uh, that can cause a big rift in the Bitcoin um, community. Uh, why, why did it come to this? Yeah, good question. Um, it's been a long time in coming, let's say that. Um, these problems were not unpredictable. Um, you know, I've been talking about them for a while, mostly in private, but sometimes, you know, these concerns surfaced in public as well. On this uh, show? Yeah, on this show. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something where I've mostly been talking about this with, you know, like guys like Vladimir and Gavin and, and other people. Um, and, and, and guys like Gregory Maxwell as well. What, we've, what we see in Bitcoin Core is it started out as a traditional open source project. Satoshi was in charge. Then he delegated to Gavin and Gavin was in charge, right? And then Gavin delegated to Vladimir and Vladimir was in charge. And that's completely normal for any technical project, right? You have one leader who listens to input from people, makes a decision. Um, Vladimir, unfortunately, does, he prefers to um, not make decisions, I would say. Um, I don't think he would disagree with his characterization. When, when there's a sort of dispute, he tends to stand back and try and hope that it sort of resolves itself into a nice consensus where everyone agrees. And when that doesn't happen, you know, he just sort of ignores um, what's happening. So Bitcoin Core sort of devolved over the last few years into this rule by consensus, which is what they call it. And, um, but it's actually much closer to... Um, anyone who wants having a veto, right? Because as long as there's anyone who's sort of objecting and making vaguely intellectual sounding um, objections, then there's no consensus and therefore the change won't happen. So this has become a huge problem, um, especially because some of the people who, um, you know, who value this and have commit access and love to sort of make these sorts of arguments, they, uh, they like, you know, theory, right? They enjoy uh, coming up with uh, complicated theories and complicated um, proposals for redesigns of Bitcoin and other things like that. And then what tends to happen is the needs, the more practical day-to-day -day needs of developers get lost, right? They'll, they'll say like, oh, I really need a simple change. And it never happens because, you know, um, theoreticians, you know, feel like, oh, I, I would rather have a completely different design that doesn't exist. Like no one has ever built what I mean uh, when I say it doesn't exist. So there's this huge problem, and this is the thing that triggered the creation of Bitcoin XT last year. It was a similar dispute over a, a similar, well, not a similar feature, but a, a different feature. And, you know, you could see this was going to come up again. We've known this was going to come up around block sizes for years, and now it finally has. So I don't know what the fix for this is, but I think Bitcoin Core needs to get back to what it was supposed to be, actually, which is, you know, a traditional project with a leader who makes decisions. But and if but that doesn't happen, then then that's what's going to trigger a fork. That's a, a very strange, in a way, that's a strange idea because now if we have, if we assume that Bitcoin Core keeps having this, this big weight and sort of 
determining some of these rules, like let's say the block size. And then uh, I find the argument a little bit strange that all these five people can agree, well, let's just give all the power to one person. I mean, that, that may be fine as long as Gavin is there and he's a rational guy and stuff. But that's, I mean, that really seems to be in conflict with the whole idea of a decentralized system where, well, you all. know. No? I mean, the, the decentralization of Bitcoin doesn't come from like the fact that there's like five guys instead of three or instead of two, right? Or even instead of one, like one to five people, you might as well say, well, the central bank has a committee that sets monetary policy. So the dollar is decentralized, right? It doesn't make any sense to view the system that way. The decentralization of Bitcoin, it comes from the fact that everyone can audit the blockchain, check the rules for themselves. It comes from the fact that, you know, there's a competitive market of implementations and ultimately from the fact that people can switch to other implementations and fork the blockchain yeah. if they want. I mean, I guess that's where, that's where you would have some sort of control and check, right? It's because, well, people have the option, like it may happen now with XT, to switch to another version. Yeah. Um, so that, I presume that, does that mean you will retain sort of the, the control, main control over XT if that becomes the main client? Or would you pass it on to Gavin or how would that work? Yeah, I've been thinking about this um, in the last few days. What I suspect will happen is one of two things. One is that if we go ahead, well, okay, let me say one of three things. One is, um, and this is what I'm hoping, Vladimir, you know, realizes this situation is unsustainable, he makes a decision. And if the decision is no block size increase, then the fork will happen. And if the decision is block size increase, then maybe, you know, we put off these problems for another day, right? We kick the can down the road a bit, but we'll have resolved the immediate issue. The second possibility is we do Bitcoin XT and um, we get the majority for the blockchain fork. Um, and in that case, I think, you know, uh, Bitcoin Core would have two choices. One is to accept the Bitcoin XT patch, right? And, and adopt the same rule set that XT is using or, or face irrelevance. And I think in that case, they would come into line, right? They would adopt 20 meg blocks or whatever the rule is. Um, and the third possibility is they don't do that and Bitcoin core just becomes completely irrelevant, right? Um, and if, if the fork happens and Bitcoin core has not released a version that comes into line, then no one will run core anymore. Right? It will become effectively an X project with no users. Um, and then at that point, it's not clear what would happen. But um, I think, you know, we would probably, tr we would, you know, people who were working on core would, would move across, right? People don't want to submit their patches to a dead project effectively, or where there's no chance of their code making it to end users. So at that point, um, whether development momentum would shift to XT or whether, you know, core would sort of, um, Core would sort of, you know, uh, secede the arguments there and, and go with the bigger blocks is unclear. As uh, I think it was, an, yeah, Andreas Antonopoulos put it on, on the LTB episodes, it doesn't matter what decision we make as, as long as you're on the right side of the consensus. That's, that's really where your, where your yeah. decision lies. So I wanted to come back to what you were saying uh, earlier about other open software projects and the fact that most open software projects have a leader that has a veto. Of course, with Bitcoin, as, as mentioned, Brian, that's a, as uh, Brian mentioned, that's a little it's a little different because you know we have that decentralized uh, ideology that's sort of baked in, and it seems sort of contrary to 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 have one person who can make all these decisions. Um, what what do you think is the ideal solution for Bitcoin, knowing that? It, it would be difficult to pass the idea that, you know, one person would have the veto on everything. How do you think we can make these decisions smoother in the future? Because they will come up, you know, a yeah, year I from think, now. I think the current else. approach is completely unsustainable and cannot continue, right? It's not just me who's lost patience with this setup. It's a lot of people. Okay, there has to be one leader. And if they make bad decisions, then the result is a fork. That's how all open source projects operate, right? Or virtually all. Of course, but you know, there's, there's the economic incentive in Bitcoin is much higher, I, I would, do you, I would do say, you see, than other projects. Do you see some sort of maybe way down the line where would one would have a, a type of voting where people maybe would vote if they have votes according to their Bitcoin holdings or something no. like that? No. I don't foresee any situation except one guy makes a decision and if people don't like his version of the software, they switch to another side. I mean, uh, the, the notion that, um, you know, like, oh, I bought, a, you, the notion you can effectively buy votes over technical matters 
uh, is never going to fly because again, what you see in like a lot of these arguments is a lot of these. You, you said it yourself earlier. A lot of these arguments don't actually make a whole lot of sense when you dig in, right? There's a lot of um, obfuscation going on. A lot of arguments that sort of superficially sound good, and then when you stop to think about things like how quickly could this code be written? Who's going to write it? Um, how much complexity will this add? What will the user interface look like? When you stop to think about these uh, questions, you realize like a lot of these proposals are not very well thought out. And, and what happens if you get like one guy, you know, what happens if like Richard Branson or the Winklevoss twins or whoever have uh, bought huge amounts of Bitcoin and they read like one mailing list post and then they say, oh, we're definitely voting for this change, right? And then other people say, well, we're, we're the ones who have to do the work, right? You can't tell volunteers what to do for a voting mechanism. That idea is DOA. So the, um, the way forward is basically to have the same system as when Bitcoin was first created, right? When Satoshi... Uh, just made the changes um, that he felt were correct to the code. And then, yeah, if people didn't like them, they could uh, switch to a different version. I don't think Bitcoin needs anything more than that, especially because actually, think about it, the core functionality of Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin XT or whatever is not that complicated. It's basically ordering transactions and updating a database um, and running little these, these little scripts. There shouldn't actually be very bitter disputes about what goes in very often, right? Um, that really shouldn't happen very yeah. much. So the yeah. the fact that you know you need these um, for you know the idea that you, people have to switch to a different version of the software to resolve disputes is really uh, should be a very rare event. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's uh, we're going to have some uh, a very interesting time ahead of us. I think that's going to be uh, a very eventful and could be a quite disruptive time for Bitcoin. And uh, let's hope that yeah. the reasonable and best way will, will go ahead. And I mean, pers personally, I, I, I do feel that uh, block size increases is, is a reasonable way. And, and I hope that will be possible to, to accomplish in a way that you know, doesn't deepen even more all those resentments that uh, obviously exist. Yeah, I, I think this is... If you dig into the core of this debate, it's a clash of vision, right? Um, between people who want to follow Satoshi's original plan and people who've decided they don't like that plan and they want something radically different and they want to force people to go along with them, right? So, yeah, that's unfortunate and we'll see how it plays out. But I'm hoping with minimum disruption is what I'm hoping for. So before we wrap up, do you want to give us uh, last time... You were here in this podcast. Uh, we talked quite a lot about Lighthouse, and uh, Lighthouse yeah. is, uh, has launched now. And it was I, I used it. I think it was like I used the first. What was the first thing again? It was I a charity, remember. charity fundraiser. Some charity, yeah, yeah. Mobile, yeah. Uh, and uh, can you give a bit of an update? Uh, yeah, sure. about how that project is going. Yeah, so um, actually, I should have some interesting stuff to announce around Lighthouse. Um, in the next few days or possibly next week. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to announcing some of this stuff. The, um, the app itself is still in beta. So uh, the progress on the code has been somewhat slow in the last uh, few weeks, partly because of this block size thing, partly because I was on vacation and so on. I've had other, been doing other things. But um, I'm looking forward to once the whole you know, Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Core thing is resolved in whichever way it's resolved, I want to get back to Lighthouse. And... Um, my, my near-term plan for Lighthouse is to take it out of beta, which means fixing bugs, raising the quality of the product, adding a few more features that should really be there. Right now, it's still very much a beta quality product, I feel. Um, and I would like to see it reach that next level of quality just so I can be totally happy with it. Um, I also, um, so after that, you know, the question is, where do we take Lighthouse after it's reached 1.0 and it's a solid crowdfunding product? Um, I'm, I'm looking at the possibility of actually evolving it into a more general sort of smart contracts wallet. The name Lighthouse is deliberately general. So we might see features crop up in Lighthouse um, that are not to do with crowdfunding, but where, you know, the concept of a wallet that has sort of general feature set and can do more things than just sending money around. That's, that's sort of what Lighthouse is probably going to be all about. Cool. That sounds very exciting. So I'm curious, um, what's, uh, what, are, what are you spending your time on most these days? Other than uh, trying to sell these disputes, <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, unfortunately, in the last few weeks, um, it's mostly you know I had to spend a lot of time reading things, writing articles, um, doing doing a bunch of other things. Um, I've I spend my time on a mix of Bitcoin J, 
which is still, you know, by far the largest project that I manage. And it's, it's very widely used at this point. You know, we get um, people um, asking questions and announcing projects with it every day, basically, at this point. So that takes up a fair bit of time. Uh, Lighthouse and, um, yeah, sort of more general, like tu doing tutorials, teaching, um, speaking at conferences and, uh, yeah, advocacy. Cool. Cool. Fantastic. So, yeah, I look forward to that. Also, if people want to check out Lighthouse, we'll have a, we'll have a link in the show notes. It's, it's actually, it's, it's really quite cool because I think it, it sort of, it sort of makes a very concrete, uh, somewhat a promise that Bitcoin has, especially the idea that you crowdfunding without a central party, I think is, is really a uh, really yeah. awesome thing. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, Mike, thanks so much for coming on. I think it's a super important topic and I'm, I'm really glad we could sort of dive into that and, and talk about it because yeah, it's absolutely crucial and absolutely crucial for the future of Bitcoin. I think it's crucial that people are aware of what's going on and, and understand the arguments. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for having me. It's been good chatting to you guys. Yeah. And yeah, to our listeners, thanks so much for joining. So we release new episodes at of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app on iOS or Android. And you can also watch it on YouTube. Uh, we are at Epicenter, youtube.com slash Epicenter BTC. And uh, of course, you can always send us a tip, which will be in the show description. So thanks so much. And until next time.